So, hello everyone. Thank you very much for being with us in our debate with Elaine Gurion today. Uh, you're all very welcome. I'm just going to say a few brief words about Elaine and then I'll um, skip the floor to her. Uh, Elaine Ian Gurion has 50 years of museum experience as a senior executive and consultant. Taylor and Francis is releasing her new volume, Centering the Museum, Writings for the Post-COVID Age, published by Taylor and Francis in September 2021, which calls on the profession to help visitors experience their shared humanity, complexity in the presentation of ideas and social uses for public buildings, to make museums more central and useful to everyone in difficult times, and identifies many small, subtle ways museums can become more welcoming to more and to all. Gurian draws on her extensive experience as a deputy director, senior advisor to high profile government museums, lecturers and teacher around the world to think about recommendations for inclusive actions by intertwining social thinking with practical decision making strategies. As an elder in the field, Elaine Gurian always speaks personal and emotional, making no distinctions between work and passion. And uh, this is what we want to hear. So I'll pass the floor to you, Elaine. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Rita. Hello. And thank you, Elaine. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to see you here, even if I only see your name. And I know some of you. Um, let me begin. I, I, I said to Maria that I didn't want to make a statement, but actually I do probably. Um, and the statement is the way you should listen to what I'm going to say, or the assumptions I'm making, and the questions in your own practice that you want to ask me. What you just heard from Rita is that I am both a deputy director and a writer and teacher. And I write philosophically about museums, but all based on practice. So I believe that small decisions all matter and that they signal large ideas. So I don't think of ideas only, I think of what are the implications in the work that you do. I have two aphorisms that I say all the time and these are every single decision you make is philosophy, every single decision you make. There is no decision in the workplace that you make that is not signaling a philosophic point of view. And all things are both themselves and a signal. That is all things do what they're supposed to, but they also signal what your philosophy is. You are transparent even though you don't think you are. I, I am, as you heard, 83 years old and I've been in this business more than 50 years. And I started as an activist on the streets of Boston in 1968, when the riots began um, about the killing of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, the mayor at the time asked all of us in the arts to go on to the streets and help the city deal with their pain by doing mobile art and mobile um, inventory things. And that's how I began. Now to you, Maria, start with that introduction and ask me anything you'd like. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you again for finding the time to talk to us. It's, it's a pleasure and it's an honor. Um, well, just to inform the colleagues who are with us today that uh, uh, we'll have one part of this discussion uh, will be based on three or four questions we have prepared and that will help us perhaps reflect deeper on the question of the activist museum and then there will be some time in the end um, let's say maybe 20 minutes some good time for you also to intervene and to ask your questions or to share your thoughts with us um, i will start by uh, asking a couple of questions about things you've already shared with us elaine and you've been very generous it's your book, Civilizing the Museum. It's all the material you make available online on your uh, website. And here I can tell everyone that Elaine's website is www.egorian.com. And there you can find lots of uh, Elaine's writings 
uh, available. Um, so uh, quite some time ago, you talked to us, you wrote about the museum end. And uh, I often go back to that text. Uh, museums seem to still have this dilemma or dichotomy, dichotomy of uh, um, having to choose between uh, uh, collections related functions or people related functions. And you talked about the museum end, the museum that is not either or. And there's also a beautiful sentence in your article where you say that it has occurred to me that perhaps my whole career was metaphorically about end. And that meant so much to us. So what do you think we are today? What does make a museum feel that they have to choose? Or if you wish, what makes a museum feel that they can choose? Hmm. So let me talk a little about and. So it's A-N-D in English. It's the tiny word that connects things. And um, museums have behaved like the tiny word between them is or, O-R, not and. But the reality is that people and ideas and situations are all complex. And they all have good parts and bad parts, and they all have parts that we agree with and that we don't agree with. And yet in the museum narrative, there is a museum or narrative. That is, here is the storyline. It's a simple, single storyline. We've trained ourselves about how we write labels and the summarizing labels as if that could happen. And in that process, we leave out in the or process, we leave out state actors, but we also make value judgments about the worth of humans. So they're villains and they're heroes. When in reality, all historic events are very complex and our best choices of bad ideas or uh, people disagreeing about ideas. So one of the things that the man named James Volkert on this uh, email, to, on this um, talk today, uh, and I are trying to figure out are what are the techniques of and in a museum? Mm -hmm. Because part of the problem, even if you agree with me philosophically, is that we have trained only in the or techniques. We collect this, but not that. For example, highbrow art, but not daily life, or daily life, but not individual artists. We make or decisions all the time, or we tell stories that are very simple, when in reality, the story wasn't simple at all, especially geopolitical stories. The consequences for me in particular, and you in Europe have to weigh these consequences but potentially differently, is that my country is coming apart. The fragility of democracy is a surprise to us all, but the, the closeness we are to really coming apart, to fighting with each other in a violent way could be seen on July 6th in the invasion of the Capitol. And if we look at museums work as a trusted institution, what my dilemma is quite now is where is healing that will allow at least some physical space that people who potentially violently disagree with each other can meet. And the next role in this very dangerous time in my country for museums is not to choose the side, but to choose the location and the techniques that will allow people to see humanity in each other's eyes, but also begin civil debate. Neither techniques do we have available to us at the moment. You're very right about that. Uh, it's somehow, it's also easier uh, not to have to you know, work harder, go deeper, listen to the other, get that other narrative out. It's it's easier to say that's it. And and many people will not even consider that they can, you know, discuss it, say, you know, give their opinion and say, let's let's have a debate about this. Um, 
in the early 90s, uh, you wrote about the, the ocean liner and turning it slowly. Uh, and we're talking about big museums. Um, at that time, you were already advocating for something that is very uh, present for all of us today. You were advocating for diverse boards and staff. You were advocating for shared leadership, broadening our collections, the adoption of explicit points of view, giving up anonymity, welcoming behaviors and interests that do not match our assumptions. Where do you think we are in 2021? Do you see changes happening? And what brings them about? What, what makes change happen if it happens? Well, you see a lot of change happening. So let me reframe your question. Is the change real? Mm. Is it heartfelt? Or is it window dressing? Is it just mm. covering up? And the, pro mm. the problem I fear for at least the most famous institutions is that it looks good, but it doesn't change anything. Mm. And the change, the change comes from philosophy starting all the way down, but, some, but bubbling up to the director. And the change is not the change that you think you know. That is, we, mm we actually need to collect more widely and we actually need to hire more widely. But the issue is much more complicated than that. We need to share power much more widely. And the power system that controls at least the museums in the United States by their board is itself a self-referential board system and the power structure of my country is uniquely and almost exclusively white, rich, and born to it. So that, and some of these um, overcome other things. So rich can overcome a number of things or well-educated can overcome a number of things. Um, I just did a family uh, history for my family. My mother came to the United States in 1928 um, as a young woman, very well educated, but had lost her ability to get married because in the German Weimar, her father had lost his money. And while she had been rich and Jewish and marriageable, she was now poor and Jewish and no longer marriageable. So there are moving targets about things, but I'm very interested in what's the real change. Mm -hmm. And I would tell my colleagues who are all here that you can make real change in small places easier than in big places. And you can make real change in non-governmental places easier than in governmental places. Mm -hmm. And that small change becomes famous and you have an outside amount of influence in small changes. Um, and that there's a system of change adoption that takes decades, unfortunately. But the notion of changing big institutions as the change agent is just impractical. So turning the ocean liner slowly was about the Smithsonian. I left the Boston Children's Museum, a change agent museum, and it caused a lot of change in the museum world and became the deputy assistant secretary for museums in the Smithsonian. So you would think I had made a step up, but my ability to cause change was almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So, so I've been a much more effective person in the sector from the small museum than the fancy title I had. Indeed. Um, let's stay a bit on the subject of change. You wrote that change by itself is so uncomfortable that institutions don't do it voluntarily or for noble reasons alone. They change because they fear the consequences of not doing so. So what do you think can make a museum fear the consequences? Because many of them seem to be so cut off from what's going on around them. It seems that nothing can touch them. They can go on with business as usual. Uh, 
what you think can and actually we see uh, like you said before uh, many times they make some statements but they are rather performative than anything else so it doesn't feel these kind of statements or positions don't feel like conscious statements what can make a museum be afraid of the consequences uh it's really an important question because there's both uh philosophic on your side you see activism you see social justice you see the word justice you do not understand why people are not doing that but when you see the real changes in museum for example when did museums take their public seriously and when did they finally take their program and their um, diversity seriously when they had to charge them money and nobody would come. Or when, the, as in America, our demographics prove that our minority majority will, is already bigger than our white population in America. So uh, when did people do justice to their indigenous collection, at least in my country, when it became the law? So one of the things that I think museum people don't work hard enough is knowing the levers of power and knowing how political systems work and stop being purists in their, in their philosophic life as their only tool. I'm always looking at what leverage do I have? Who do I know? How can I force this to happen? even though I feel in my heart it might be right. Um, becoming a political activist means you know also how the system works and how you can force the system to work. I see Eeyor is here, so let me tell a story about Eeyor. When I started to work for him in Kyiv, he, he has a cousin named Bodan. Um, Bodan is a photographer and but Dan follows Eeyore absolutely everywhere and takes pictures of absolutely everything. And when I am in Ukraine, Bodan follows me everywhere and takes pictures of me absolutely doing everything. It's like the paparazzi. And in the beginning, I thought, why are we taking pictures in this small country? And, and a, a, a while ago, um, the, our, the police invaded uh, the office and because they document everything and because people are looking at everything, their protection became quite clear. Everybody knew what was going on. Bodan was taking the same pictures he did, but in fact in a dangerous situation. So what Eeyore has used is a seemingly innocuous thing, we take pictures, we document, we're a museum, to do a form of self-protection. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. If you know how the system works, you know how to get from a good idea to a forced good idea by using the system at the same time you are talking about the good idea. Yeah. So do you think activist museums, because there are a few, should be worried about alienating uh, some people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a decision you should decide right from the beginning. So in a Holocaust museum or uh, in the Holocaust museum, your question really is, do you want only the people who believe in the Holocaust and only the people who believe that um, whatever happened in the Holocaust was terrible to come to the museum. Because if you make no room for the humanity of any of the others, they won't come. And while you think it's a politically important statement to have the Holocaust Museum there, because it becomes incontrovertible, if that's enough for you, yes. But if you want everybody to come, then you must use tools that look at the humanity of other people. And you have to begin to look at who else who were seemingly on the wrong side of this history were trying to help you. It's part of the reason, for example, that in the story of slavery, we look at the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, which was the system un under 
secret system to help runaway slaves. It was fueled a lot by religious white people. It's a way to talk about an incursion into the opposition where their hearts were pure and where we could tell their story. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want only your people who believe in you are ready to come, you must take this on as you begin. Mm -hmm. Yes, because many times uh, there are colleagues who are afraid that we are preaching to the converted. So it's only, always a dialogue among people who have more or less the same opinion. Uh, that's right. So that's, that's, that's um, yeah, that's a great point you're bringing up. Um, I have one more question and then we can hear also from the people who have joined us. I'm going back to your article, Turning the Ocean Liner Slowly, which was written in 1990. And then 15, late, 15 years later, you wrote an afterword. And uh, there you, you, you could identify some trends that could be celebrated, some changes, but you said that most institutions were remaining fundamentally unchanged. And then you wrote that you were feeling tired and that you would look to your younger colleagues. And at the time you wrote, with fire in their bellies and a mixture of naivete and uh, idealism to take up the cause. Now, although some of us, some who are not young anymore, like myself or others who are truly young are looking up to you and feel your support. At the same time, you're not exactly someone who has retired and much less has given up. Actually, a new book is coming up, Centering the Museum. What keeps you going, Elaine? Well, um, everybody in this room keeps me going. And I've had a long think about my role as an elder. I like the term elder. It's a term indigenous people use. They have roles. The American Indians um, and the Canadian First Peoples have roles for elders. I like to think that what I have is the ability to support you and the ability to help you learn strategies um, so that you are not naive and uh, so that you don't lose your fight. But I don't have your energy and I don't have your um, experience, your network, your people. So I think I can be abuela, which is what they call me in <laughs> And Argentina, I, I, I can be a good uh, fairy godmother, but it is really you that we are going to rely on. Um, I think we don't spend enough time making these alliances so that um, those of us who remain active and who are older can be helpful. And in part because those of us who remain older often also think we should remain in charge, but I don't mm. think that. Um, it gives me great pleasure to see people learning and carrying on themselves. And I'm not only in a kind of patronizing way or a grandmother way, but also because I learn a lot from the young people who I get to interact with. That's great. Thank you, Elaine. I would invite our colleagues who are who have joined us today. If they want to turn their cameras on, and uh, if they would like to ask a question, share their thoughts. But if you can use your the um, uh, raise hand button or just turn your mic on, whatever is more comfortable for you. Um, and while you're doing that, let me put a question out for you. I think mm -hmm. the world of work needs to be re-interrogated. I think we need to write new job descriptions, have new titles, have new organizational structures. I think the assumptions of the world of work are based on gender priority and on this assumption that if you have power, you're better than those who don't. That's what a hierarchy is. And are family unfriendly and I think one of the ways in which diversity is going to happen, I mean, look at all the women here in this. And um, the assumption, for instance, that if your child gets sick, you are supposed to go to work. That's the first priority. Um, makes, I, I live in the Caribbean, 
that is not the first priority. And the assumption about the work in the Caribbean where I live is that the people are lazy because work is not their first priority, but in reality, family is their first priority. So I've learned a lot by living there that we have assumptions in our human relations office and in work itself that I think needs to be looked at. Mm. Just to add to what Elaine was saying, uh, a few months ago, I read a book called uh, Be More Pirate. And then I'm reading the sequel, which is called How to Be More Pirate. And it's very interesting because it's about making new rules. If the rules are not okay, if we, if we cannot go on with business as usual, maybe we should write our own rules, get together and like pirates and do our own rules. Would anybody like to say something, ask a question or... I, I'll pick from Marlene. what you have just said. First, I would like to um, truly thank uh, Elaine for um, for her um, spirit and for her um, enlightenment that is continuous from the years that we were students to, to now. Um, I love your work in every way. I picked up um, several things from what you said, starting from the end a proposition uh, and I was um, when, when I was following some uh, seminars on psychology uh, the psychologists were often saying that uh, the uh, end is very important in a sentence especially from uh, parents to children because usually parents want to encourage their children in, but they do it in a wrong way and they say you are very good but you could be better when you need to say you are very good and you can do this. So um, it, it, I would think the end is very important, not only because it um, uh, contradicts the or, but it contradicts the any buts, any... Uh, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, regarding uh, the last point you mentioned about how you we need to change things in our work environment and what Maria said about being more pirating and uh, more um, courageous, my question is, how much do we get overwhelmed by fear? Fear of any kind, fear of losing our jobs, fear of not having enough money, fear uh, because we don't get the best job, the best paid job. How much fear do we get from criticism from our colleagues? Fear of not being recognized in our field. So um, and these are things usually not said. We are not always honest. Um, most often we're not um, totally honest about this um, fundamental uh, emotion that is fear and sometimes um, rules out um, any wish that we may have for change. So fear uh, versus freedom of not being fearful. <laughs> well, let, let me, let's talk a second about fear. You listed a whole re set of reasons to be fearful and I want to separate them. Uh, I am the daughter of a rich man. And while I am not the rich person, my capacity to leave my job has always been in my life. And I am mindful that I was never fearful about losing my job because my family was not dependent on my money. And I am very mindful that that fear is not a fear I can speak to and is a gigantic fear of gigantic reality to many people. And I, I want to separate that aside. For people who cannot lose their job, their fear is connected in a very real way. Mm -hmm. There are other fears. There's, and there are people quite like me who can't help themselves. So as much as I tried to care about certain things, I really didn't care about them. So I, I refer to them as suicide pilots. They, that isn't what motivates them. And for activists, often they are motivated from something different. I think if you want to be an activist, you must be willing, for example, to lose your job that your job 
cannot be the motivating factor of all your decisions. And if you have no other opportunity to get another job, I have complete trust in you that you cannot lose your job, that there are dependents, there's whole reasons for that. So I would start with fear is not all the same and that you have to interrogate yourself about where is your fear and are you willing to give that fear up? That it is not all of the same value and it is not all of the same action. And I have done that. And I would also say that those people who are judicious about using their fear, the people who know how to stay in their job, the people who know how to make tiny changes while staying in their job are the ones who are making the real changes. So the originators of the, I, I wrote a paper called Being the Third on Your Block, which is useful in this context. The first on your block, that is the originators of the ideas are people really who are, can't help themselves. But the second ones, the ones who incorporate new ideas, but make it safe for that incorporation and don't lose their job over it. And even if they take small steps, are real heroes and we don't give them enough. We, we look for the big splashy change. It's the little incremental change that matters. And I think losing your job should be the last resort, not the first. And I don't think you should be making splashy changes which make people shy away from you. And I think you should be learning how to make changes that are acceptable, but changes nevertheless, because they become like a virus and they become the way in which things are ordinarily done. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Nina, before I give the word to you, I would like to tell colleagues who might not feel comfortable in asking a question in English, that they can do it in their language and then we'll translate it. Please, please feel free. So Nina. It's, um, it's about what uh, um, we were just hearing uh, right now about this uh, uh, fear, about the different kinds of uh, fear and uh, about activism. Uh, in fact, uh, there are different types of fear and uh, some of us can afford of, uh, making steps and having some attitudes in our workplaces and uh, not, for instance, suffering retaliation or losing our jobs, etc. But there are other people, and I, I will have to say this, for instance, uh, uh, like, like myself and other people here, that uh, cannot afford that. But, uh, That's right. Want, and if you want to make a change, uh, I'm an activist. Uh, I, I have to. I have to do it, and uh, I know that uh, I, I, I'm suffering those consequences. For instance, right now during the, the COVID, I was in this program, uh, PhD, etc., and uh, I verbalized some things that was that were happening in my university. And um, when we start going to the workplace again, uh, my orientators and uh, etc. They said, "Oh, the client is not pay paying, etc. We have to let you go right now." And I, I talked with the client personally, and he said, "No, we are paying. Of course, we are paying." And it was a city hall and etc. So. Well, it was an excuse. Spoken, <laughs> so it was. Yeah. It's it's a little it's a little bit different. I just want to, to say it's it's very very short. Um, I watch this uh, webinar like we're doing now, and I don't know if it is this doctor called Bettina Love. I don't want to say. She, she used two two words: uh, she, uh, uh, allies and co concentrators. She said that uh, allies is those who say, for instance, yes, uh, racism is bad, this is bad, etc. I support you, I'm anti-racist, etc. 
school bus operators are those who who knows that perhaps I may lose my job. So mm. they they have to be willing sometimes to to lose something. Lose something. Well, let, let me start with, I'm sorry, Nina, and uh, this is an, an incredibly important story, which is that you have among you somebody for whom there have been consequences. Um, and the first response really is, I'm sorry, uh, that's, um, that's a big deal. The second is that if you look at the screen, there are lots of you and that the collective has political clout and people don't use the collective sufficiently often on personal issues. Like if injustice has been done for personal issues, the collective itself as people can, can join together. Uh, the, the third is that all of us have a moral core and there is something I refer to as this far and no further. There's a moment in our life, regardless of our situations, when we are not willing to go any further. They usually have to do with physical threat to our well-being, but they don't always. So one of the things you need to know about yourself is where are those places? Where is this far and no further? But the other, the other is what, what ways can we magnify and make use of the things that we wish to have change within the collective, within this association? For example, that look innocuous, that are not intentionally provocative, that are not intentionally alienating, but that indeed cause change. So I don't know more about what caused this break in the funding for Nina, but that is an investigation worth looking at and then trying to figure out, is that something that the group wants to do something about or her friends want to do something about or the family. But there, are, one of the ways Black Lives Matter re, um, response reinforced for Americans is that taking collectively to the streets in America has power. Um, and we hadn't seen that since the Vietnam War, except the pussy uh, the day after um, Donald Trump got elected and a million people in all, in all cities of America took to the streets. So remember you have more tools than your individual tool. Yeah. Denise? Um, thank you very much for such wonderful words, uh, Ms. Gurian. You talked about the ability to support the others. Uh, could you speak uh, a little more about the concept of care related to museums? Could care be the fundamental uh, obligation of museums and how? How to, to, to use, how to, to, to uh, put in action the concept of care uh, related to museums. Thank you. So let's look at care big and care little and care in more than one location. Um, there are people now using museums as places of direct care with direct um, medical conditions. So you see Visitation to the museum for children with Asperger's will happen at this hour because we'll turn all the lights and all the music off and families can come in a certain situation. Or we specialize in Alzheimer's and dementia and um, 
you can bring your group and we will, we are experienced and know how to talk to you. So there's the actual care with actual medical conditions. There's a lot of people working on it. And Mark O'Neill, when he was doing research for the Glasgow uh, city government proved that going to museums saves lives in a real sense, extends lives, it's really good for you. And people working with Alzheimer's have proven that going to a museum cuts down on their immediate medication, for example. So there's that. Uh, Body Pittman is doing work about brain development and training doctors for chronic care people and use of art museums. So there's a whole world. Lois Silverman has written a book. She's a public health nurse or sociologist about museums directly in help in that situation. There is the notion of fairness in, um, in the world of work. That is, what is the expectation for work in the, for people working in museums? One of the things in America is that we assume overwork. We assume you decided to work because it was in your heart and therefore we should take advantage of you. We have assumed for a long time that if you're rich, you could volunteer at the museum and not get paid. Those assumptions about who is working and what care they need are being looked at now in the world of diversity. So. Uh, Denise asking about care and personal care is something you can take up as your agenda as you look at your own museum. What is this expectation for overwork? What is this expectation for taking time off? What is authorized time off? What is authorized taking care of your children? What does that mean? And then there is the use of whether the museum is an institution of care for the healing of the, of the society itself. Do you allow people to use your toilets? Do you allow people to use your electricity? Do you, are you forcing people to behave only as museum visitors because you have no public responsibility. I argue you have public responsibility and your assets, that is your toilets, your seating, your heating, your water are a public amenity and that the care, for instance, of the homeless or the care on a hot day uh, for access to water without coming into the museum or the access to broadband in poor societies is part of your responsibility. So in the same way that I said to other people about fear, I parse them, I make them into small pockets, and then I decide on the policy that relates to care in each different category. Thank you, Elaine. Anna? Hi. Thank you, Elaine, for being with us. Um, you talked about uh, the need of new jobs, the uh, descriptions for museum workers. Um, in your opinion, what would be the job description for a leader for a, 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 an activist museum? In your view, what would be this job description? <laughs> no, not. I'm, I'm very afraid let me, let me tell you a story. In my country, one of the ways big museums are trying to show you that they really believe in diversity is that they're appointing a director of diversity. It is the easiest way to not get it done. The person has no allies, has no power, has no uh, network, is out there be, and is gonna be blamed when the diversity doesn't happen. It's a setup. So activism is really a decision within the collective of the museum. And it should not be in your face activism because that scares everybody and drives down who visits you. I am much more interested in nuance and small ideas. I'm much more interested in the issue of welcome I'm much more interested in 
whether you have coffee, do you serve coffee for free? Um, what does it mean? Because you're signaling by who is welcome an activist position. So I'm not a big fan for banging on the table because I think you get less done. I'm much more about these sliding consequences. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lenny. Igor? Thank you so much uh, to Maria for initiating this discussion and introducing me to Elaine. And thank you, Elaine, to, for introducing me to Jim. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, we, are, we have a kind of a philosophical uh, talk and discussion, but in reality, um, I, can, I can approve that Elaine's philosophy is very instrumental in practice because what she is writing in her books or talking in her lectures very quite instrumental uh, for the museums which are at, on the beginning of their development and we I had the pleasure to work with Elaine uh, for several periods and I, I appreciate so greatly her vision, her ideas, her experience uh, and the question is uh, the museums are so different in different environments uh, and uh, in general, in, in a lot of very important books, especially published in Western world, in Western Europe, in the United States, uh, there are very useful strategies and philosophy for the museum development and for the perspectives of museum, uh, of, of the museum future. But uh, a lot of museums uh, function in quite different environments. And situations. And for example, uh, for Western museums in the open world, activism and uh, strive for change can be very beneficial. But in, for some museums, it can be a big threat. And uh, museums can be under attacks of politicians, informational attacks. And in many, in many countries, museums are so um, defenseless in this new post-truth uh, life in this information and hybrid war. So my question is how to balance all the things and how to make museums really effective and uh, being able uh, to, uh, to be sustainable in their development because sometimes too many activism can mean the finish of the project. And as you mentioned today, the threat even to physical life. And we have witnessed uh, how the even implementation of new museum definition, definition at the ICOM General Assembly in, in Kyoto have just such big discussions and even postponed acceptance of the new definition because it is not acceptable for many museums in this world. So what to do in this complicated situation and environments for, for quite a big number of museums, uh, which are so different from your environment, for example? Really a very important question. And um, the answer is, as all my answers are complicated. So let me, um, I refer to myself as an auto mechanic. I don't own the car. I haven't picked the car but I can help you fix it. And the way I can help you fix it and the way Eeyore and I and Jim work together is that I don't assume I know anything about Eeyore's culture. In fact, Eeyore knows everything about his culture and I have much to learn about his culture. So my job is only to facilitate going in the direction he wishes to go. And my job is only to put my experience on the table for him so that he can pick within it um, what works for his culture. Because indeed, Eeyore is under threat in a physical sense that I am not. I'm sitting here looking at the trees. Um, and I learn a huge amount from doing that, from being allowed, it's a privilege, to 
run the meeting for Eeyore and to tell my experience, but not to be in charge of Eeyore and not to determine what he picks out of any of it. And let me tell you what Eeyore does. Eeyore takes every possible advantage of any public space that anybody will offer him for any reason. He does pop-up exhibitions, he does publications, he does speeches, he travels around, he goes to funerals, he goes to celebrations. His museum, it has signs everywhere, is visible, he has no museum. He has the most presence in his city and he has no museum. And they will notice if the museum disappears because his presence is so big, but his presence isn't physical. Well, that's what I learned from him. And then they gave him a tiny space and it became a big presence and people come and they can get coffee and they can get water and they can learn about the Maidan, but they can also have a class there. And they... So I have learned a huge amount from him. And what I have to offer is only experience, and ideas, and the other thing I have to offer is I'm not Ukrainian. I'm an American. I get forgiven a lot. She doesn't know anything. She's not Ukrainian is very useful. He can, and we have dinner at night to figure this out. I can say stuff that they're not listening to him about because I can say anything because I'm not Ukrainian or Indian or New Zealand. I'm a stupid American. And that's a useful position. So if you start to trade with each other, the externalizing, that's useful. Um, but Eeyore is totally 100% right. I cannot know what is good for him. And I would tell you to read less of our stuff and to talk to us more only because we need to learn from you and because we need to watch what it is that you are contending with in order to understand what we need to be doing. This notion that because I am in America and I've been in the Smithsonian gives me any authority. What gives me authority is that I'm really friendly and over the top. What I, I really like people. I really hang around. I really love the food. That's the only thing that I really have access to. Uh, we're very grateful you are that kind of a stupid American, Elaine, and that you shared so much with us today. And you, I think you inspired us, you inspired us once again. And we are grateful also for your support. We feel it. Uh, and I would like also to thank all the colleagues who joined us today, who shared also their views and their questions. We'll be back with this series of discussions that uh, are trying to get us deeper into thinking about the activist museum after the summer holiday. So we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much. All. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've had a lovely time. Thank you.